What's up everybody? Welcome back to the channel. In today's video, we have all three of us yet again. Yeah. And we are going to look at a thread of people that were accepted to medical school and we're gonna dissect it a little bit. We're hopefully gonna find a pattern that you guys can see. Maybe not, maybe it's just random. Maybe. Um, but we're just gonna go through applications and see what made them successful and uh, help them get into med school. And we can see if some of this stuff matched up to the would you get in video that we did earlier. And I know that caused a little bit of anxiety. Hopefully going through these, I'm predicting might reduce your anxiety to see, you know, if you match to some of these accepted applicants and kind of help calm your nerves as well. So let's get into it. So as you guys can see, there is a compiled list here of all of these kind of breakdown topics. So they give us their major, the MCAT scores, their GPAs, um, some detailed information like clinical experience, volunteering, like basically they cover every single thing of the application cycle. This is TVK315, uh, admitted to an MD school, neuroscience and psychology double major, GPA 3.4, science GP 3.2, MCAT scores 514, number of schools which sent primaries 23, she got 22 secondaries, uh, number of interviews received four, that's pretty good. Total number of post-interview acceptances is one. Total number of post-interview waitlist and rejections, two waitlists, one rejection. And again, people who had anxiety about their 3.4s, 3.5s. I think a lot of this read already, we have two people, you know, 3.6, 3.5, 3.4 that are in. So again, this video is kind of maybe to reverse some of the anxiety that we caused in our last video. Well, I think um, we were reading like specifically really successful ones, right. didn't we? We were like handpicking those ones. Right, right. So. Let's see what made up for that GPA though. The research she has, research in two labs for one year with one completed poster. So no pubs, but she has a poster. Um, 800 plus hours of clinical research. That is heavy research hours. Her general thoughts is what I want to get to. She literally says, have a theme for your application, create a narrative. I've been screaming this from the beginning, is that your narrative is the most important thing that you can ever do. Because even now, just ever since we started these videos, when you look at these applications, it literally looks like, like it's not boring, obviously. It's not anything like that. It's everyone's amazing. Everyone's worked hard, but you have to like try extra hard to convince the people who are reading it that you're not boring. And half of that is gonna happen, most of it is gonna happen through your narrative. So even if she does have 800 plus hours, to be honest, if you're flipping the and you're sitting here, that really doesn't sound as impressive as like your essay is gonna sound. Mm. No, that's another question we have. That's a great point that you bring up the narrative time your application. Narrative is everything. Maybe you can explain that a little more because it'd be constantly your questions. What do you mean by tying your application together? What do you mean by a narrative? Like, what are you trying to say with that? Yeah, just like basically, obviously you have your personal statement, which is probably the most important thing about your narrative. Your activities should hopefully give the readers that are going to review your application some sort of idea of who you are. Because if they can kind of connect with you in any sort of way, like they know you're this athlete that's been struggling with your grades, but then you raised your grades or you're like, um, someone with a child or something like that and they can kind of relate to your struggles or um, like your experience in college, that will really help. So let's move on to the next applicant here. This is Ali Zard and I think she goes to UC Berkeley because the major is integrated biology which is pretty unique to UC Berkeley. Um, <laughs> oh, dang, cumulative GPA 4.0, size GPA 4.0, MCAT scores 524. Um, I know, Jesus, this is quite an applicant. Did you twin, Sean? I know. I know. My Trump, did you sign up for your application on here? <laughs> number of schools which just sent primaries, 24. Number of schools, 24. Uh, received interviews, received 12. And acceptance is 3. Still, I would think, isn't that like, no, what That's do you think about those numbers? That's is that normal? normal? That's about normal. Okay. Versus. That's on the positive side, not normal. Yeah, That's what really I like am lucky. noticing though mm. is that, at least for me, like back in the day, I used to hear like a ton of people who got interviews got in. Like even from here, a lot of people that are getting interviews are now getting waitlisted or rejected. Mm -hmm. I don't know why that is. Yeah. But I think like it ends up being like 25% or less of interviews you end up getting an acceptance into right mm -hmm. like that's what i'm seeing anecdotally at least from like right. uc berkeley uh from that perspective mm -hmm. um but what do you guys think 
Like, no, it's not I like, I would think back in the day, I don't know why in my head, it was like maybe like a 50% chance if you get an interview at a good school, you'll get in or something exactly. like 40%. Now it seems like more in like the 20-ish, maybe barely hitting like 30. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, continuing on, research and pubs. They spent two summers at Oak Ridge National Lab, basically two posters. Um, it looks like they're working on a pub and then a couple posters. So again, you don't need to have the pubs or anything like that. Even with the Stellar application, you got three three acceptances, so. Yeah, you don't need a publication. You just need to show that you're doing some research. Right, right. And you can see a heavy amount of hours, also around 2,000 hours. Um, okay, well, just right off the bat, I feel like if I was a person reading this, I would probably think, why do, what does this application give me to think that this person's not just a bookworm? Like, where does, can I see that this person has like life experience? And you can see that this person clearly tried to display that. The one thing that I picked up on though in med school is you probably don't want to write that you spent hours shadowing dermatology and plastic surgery as your specialty of choice, just because that's going to come with bias from uh, staff. Just because uh, if you pick in general like high paying fields where uh, there's a little bit of stigma attached, they might think that you're coming to med school just to make money or like, I don't know, that you, I don't know. It's not, Sometimes it might be nice to just branch into a field that isn't so elite, quote unquote, with like finances and stuff. Because um, in medicine, they do hold a stigma. Not that it's wrong, but I wouldn't write it on my application if I just shadow plastic surgery. That's a great, That's a great that. insight. Because yeah. yeah, I think a lot of people in college, even me, I didn't really understand how much stigma there was in certain specialties. But when you get into medical school, people hate on people for certain specialties, for doing certain things. People hate it's real. It's actually real in um, medical school. Yeah, they don't like, if your top three are plastic surgery, derm, and like, I don't know, ortho, you wanna show a little bit more like you've had experience in giving back to the community as far as like, maybe physicians who don't earn as much, just to show your integrity. Not that you don't have it, but you wanna display it a little bit. Also with all of these, you're never really gonna know what their narratives were just based off of this bullet point list. What we're getting an insight into is their AMCAS, not really the narrative that was built. We can try to thread the narrative, but honestly, I feel like mostly what we're seeing is like hours here, hours there, hours there. This is actually a really strong application. I think that there is a bias on people who immediately have like a good grade in MCAT that people are going to judge them. In general, I think that uh, she probably had something that in her personal statement that allowed her to get all those interviews because even with great stats like that, those are astronomical stats, I think most schools would give an interview. But also I think when it comes to actual acceptances, which is why even though she had 12 interviews, she only got three acceptances only, even though three acceptances is great. Um, and five wait lists is probably because maybe something was a little bit more lacking in the personal statement or in EC activities or something like that. But I think you, pretty much guarantee yourself a lot of interview invites if you have stats like this. Will it get you in? Uh, if that's the only thing on your application, I don't think it'll get you in as much as uh, having other things. So let's go over this application. I actually think this is a very strong application. Um, let's go through this one. This is JJK, very difficult name to say, um, Psych BS. So they have a GPA of 3.51. They did a post back and now has a GPA of 3.96. Their science oh, that's GPA- That's a huge increase. I think it's a separate GPA. Oh, that was, just, that was GPA. a post back GPA. Science okay. GPA is 3.6 and their post back GPA was 3.95 um, science. So okay. their MCAT score 518. Um, let's see here. Gap years. They took three gap years in between graduation and post back. Uh, so a lot of gap years. That's a lot of time. Uh, applied to 42 schools, 41, oh, let's see, interviews 10 three acceptances and was smart enough to apply to DO backups as well. Got two DO acceptances. Um, so was that included in the three acceptances? Or no, total five three? acceptances okay. um, and three MD wait listed. Uh, you can see here 330 hours of research or so not as research heavy, but here's where I think this application tells the story where we're, it's a prime example of what we've been talking about, how to weave everything together and why I think this is such a strong application. Uh, 1800 hours working in a group home, 240 hours volunteering in a hospice, which is a pretty intense environment as well. A very emotional environment. You can really pick up on a lot of things uh, working in a hospice. Um, Non-clinical volunteering, 460 hours on a crisis text line, nursing home, working with children, special needs. Do you see like this theme coming together? Uh, specialty of interest, not 
anything in particular, but is interested in working with geriatrics. Like look at that story. How much are this is this person going to have to talk about during an interview and how their experiences can back up what they're saying. I think this is a super strong application showing in the post back that they're doing really well in their, in their school. And, um, I think this is the way to go. I think this the is one thing I will say though, is that, um, for one, I think it's becoming more difficult though for admissions committees because you're essentially now starting to compare apples to oranges because this person had three years additional mm -hmm. and that's not feasible for everyone. Um, it's kind of also becoming problematic now because now these people, I'm assuming he either volunteered for those jobs or was paid very minimal wage. Right. And um, that is just not feasible for everyone. Sometimes people really need to start paying off their loans from college and it's just not realistic. So I think it's a little problematic that that's becoming what even the average student coming out of college is compared to. Like Herm mm -hmm. says, clearly this person has a story. Not everyone has the time to build that story. For point. example, those jobs might not even be available for students who don't even have a bachelor's yet. You know, you mm -hmm. might have to have a bachelor's to be even required for a job like that. So it is an amazing application. Those types of students are the ones who get into medical school, I think a lot of the times nowadays, but um, you can't automatically think that that's what you have to do, especially when if you're the type of student who's coming straight out of college. But a big point to take away from this is you can still, while you're in doing your undergrad, you could have still tailored your volunteer experience day that makes sense in a story. And yeah. it's not just for an application process, something that you want to do. Like from this, I can tell with the way this person has put it together, maybe they're just really good at putting it together, but I can tell they really do have a passion for working with these kind of end of end stage life patients. And that's a really good uh, story to tell, that to have, and have experiences to back it up. Yeah, I agree. I think it's also difficult though because the truth is in college a lot of people are pretty open to different things in medical school. Like a lot of people don't go into medical school knowing exactly which specialty or what exactly what exact job that they want. So for those people it's a little difficult. You could build your story off for example, my uh, I feel like my resume is without even trying starting to look like I want to be a medical educator. That's become the theme of a lot of my activities just naturally because that's what I want to do. So it's not necessarily I'm, I mean yes, I'm building towards my specialty of choice now that I'm late in the game. Like I'm two years in, I'm starting to do that. But at the same time, when I got into med school and a lot of the things I did before med school are educator based. So maybe, you know, building a story in a different way like that mm -hmm. could be beneficial for students. So awesome. next one is GPA 3.7, MCAT is 517, gap years two, was 11 interview invites, two acceptances, three wait lists, withdrew from all schools. Um, so he got a full scholarship from one, six years of research in pubs, and he had one publication, eight abstracts. Jesus, eight abstracts. That's, yeah, this that's guy's... more than anyone in med school. Yeah. <laughs> he took gap years, right? <laughs> yeah, but yeah. yeah, I guess eight abstracts. General thoughts, develop relationship with mentors. That's really important. What do you I got? think letter, letters of rec are underrated on how important they can be, especially if you're working for like a research year and you develop a close relationship with your mentor, he's really gonna help you, especially if you're applying like MD, PhD, that's super important and even MD. So I think letters of rec are probably the most underrated part of an application. Yeah, he says here, I got several comments on the trail about how much my letters of rec stood out. So there you go. it definitely makes a difference. Also, I think like it's, it doesn't always hurt you, but it can definitely help you a ton. I think that's the way letters work. Like, mm -hmm. It might not necessarily, like everyone probably mostly gets generic letters, to be honest. Maybe we get one good one. But um, if they really stand out, I think they can really help you a lot. Uh, focus on your writing, months honing my essays. Uh, so I think after going through all of these, I think some common themes are a lot of these individuals are taking gap years. If that's something you're kind of on the fence about and you can see yourself doing gap years, I think that's a really solid idea. Do a gap year, put together your research, put together all of your application, um, strengthen your GPA, whatever you need to do, because you're competing against people that are taking two, three years off and are coming super ready for that. Also, I think I might do a video on my channel talking about like med school in general and like if that's really what you want to do and like just knowing what you're getting into because like even though I had two brothers who were in med school, every med school is different and like, I don't know, everyone's experience is different and it's just a, I just feel like, I don't know, 
I just make sure this is what you want to do like there's so many people applying there's so many people who want to do this and it's amazing and awesome but like it's also important to know what you're getting yourself into so along with the gap year I think another takeaway from this is to like we said in a previous video and hopefully you got more of a feel from it from this video is how to create a narrative how to have everything really connect to make sense for somebody reading your application so that when they're going through all these hours and hours of stuff that you stand out because they made that connection because like I said that psych the person that had all that stuff really did stand out to me. Everything started to make sense on the application. It looked like a solid application. So there's that. And then, yeah, my takeaway is there really isn't one way into medical school. Like there are people here that we've read, I don't know if we'll cut them out or not, that got in mostly due to stats. There are people that got in without the stats that had a lot of volunteer experience. There are people who had gap years and had time to do research and stuff. So everyone can take a different route, but as long as you show commitment and you stand out from others doing that same route, there is a lot, there's definitely That's a lot of I luck think, involved. Yeah. Like there's some people that got 11 interviews that, so they're obviously qualified, but they end up getting like two acceptances. There are people right. that end up getting five interviews and then five acceptances. A lot of these applications are looking so similar, like the hundreds of hours of uh, shadowing, of volunteering, of working at hospitals. Everybody has that here. Yeah. So I think it's harder and harder for admissions committees to see like what exactly differentiates people. So they just gotta stick with bias. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, that's gonna be it for this video. I hope you guys liked it. Make sure to subscribe down below if you haven't, and we will see you in our next video. Bye guys. All right, see later. You.